Welcome to the Everyday Citizens Tactical Podcast, Episode 21, Developing Citizenry Groups. My name is Jeremy and I will be your host. Today I'm joined by Call Sign Badger, leader of the 1st Pennsylvania Mountain Regiment, a volunteer community service group based out of Pennsylvania. Today we talk about organization, training, recruiting, and a lot more that goes into developing a citizens-based group. So, without further delay, let's begin. Tell me turn it down and I'ma only turn up louder Call me what you wanna but you can't call me no coward Strength in numbers, we the people still the ones with power Fighting fire with fire, time to take back what is ours Tell me turn it down and I'ma only turn up louder Call me what you wanna but you can't call me no All right, guys, welcome back to the podcast after that brief break. And Badger, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, buddy. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for coming on. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, this here Badger is kind of the, the head honcho over at First PMR. And Badger, you want to go ahead and you know introduce yourself and talk a little bit about who you are and what PMR is? Uh, sure, man. My name's uh, well, I go by Badger online. A lot of people know me by Badger, so it's just become a moniker of mine. Just your average guy, former military, nothing special. Just a former comms nerd trying to get back into the uh, cyber game. And uh, with a group of buddies of mine, we kind of put our heads together, tried to break through that typical, you know, Minuteman militia shell we saw for the past decade and tried to form something a little bit more coherent, a little bit more focused. So that's kind of how the PMR came to be. Nice. Uh Kilgore specifically requested that I ask you about the history of PMR. You know, what, what is the backstory of it? Oh, like, okay. Yeah, sure. Sure. So the, uh, well, as I said, we, it was, uh, initially just three of us. We saw a bunch of pop-up groups, uh, as I said, over the past decade or so. And they were mostly just uh, like vitriolic, very loud, very boisterous, uh, groups who had no real purpose. They would just go stand on like the Capitol steps and shouted people mm-hmm. wearing, wearing camouflage. And I'm like, that's, that's great and all if you want to just be that guy, but you're not getting anything accomplished. Mm-hmm. So we uh, decided to give ourselves a mission and give ourselves a little bit more focus. And uh, we, we kind of tossed around the idea of like, what exactly do we hope to accomplish? And we we're like, well, the community seems like it's splintering off. You know, nobody knows their neighbor's name anymore. Mm-hmm. So we're like, why don't we try to focus our efforts on building our neighborhood, building our communities, strengthening bonds, things like that. And uh, we'll keep a tactical aspect of it as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, you know, do our typical tactical training, things like that, keep ourselves sharp. But we'll also do community outreach, um, you know, community training, things like that. As we did, uh, we hosted a couple uh, first aid classes. And I think it was uh, last month, it was surprisingly very successful but uh, the name itself uh, Pennsylvania Mountain Regiment actually came from a historical unit that stemmed from the Revolutionary War uh, which was the 1st Pennsylvania Regiment Uh, then they reactivated in the Civil War from three counties uh, that ironically the three of us were from nice so we looked at it and we're like you know it's it's almost like we just took a lineage from it from the the founding of this nation, uh, the fighting and defending of it during the Civil War for the Union side, and <clears throat> not as if we're in a fight right now, but we're almost fighting to preserve what we have and preserve our communities and uh, just be that bulwark that your average person doesn't really have to count on. So we decided to adopt the name 1st Pennsylvania Regiment. Only there's already another group with that name, but they're more like historical reenactors, and it's it's like a living history group. Gotcha. So, so to avoid confusion with them, we decided to throw in the mountain moniker <clears throat> or the mountain identifier because we do most of our training uh, in the Appalachians. So kind of some, kind of fit the bill and uh, we stuck with it and ran with it and all felt good about it. And it just it just felt right. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. Do you guys uh, – so you say you do a lot of your stuff in the mountains. Are you guys more concentrated to – a certain portion of Pennsylvania or are you guys Pennsylvania considered as a whole? So at the moment we are primarily in the Southeast 
region mm-hmm. uh, from the southern border up to, I mean, as high up as you want to go. But we're primarily on the eastern side of the PA. Uh, we would like to expand. I mean, we have a four-hour uh, radius. <clears throat> Guys, if you live within four hours, you're more than welcome to come into the group. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as of right now, just operationally, we are southeast. And that kind of brings me into, I guess, one of the next questions, which is in regards to recruiting. But, I mean, we're kind of the same way. We have a limitation as to, you know, for the local guys I run with, we got a limitation as to how far or how, you know, how wide we recruit. You know, one of the big things, and I think you and I have talked about this privately in the past. Um, It might have been somebody else, but I I feel like a lot of – movements for everyday people to start trying to do something good for the community. And they are organizing regardless of the connotation that, you know, the term organizing holds. I think things start to break down and fail when guys try to get too big. Oh, um, sure. Specifically sure. when things try to go national, you know, mm-hmm. just nothing good comes of that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, just like with anything, you want to control your expansion. You don't want to, you don't want to blow up too fast. And, Mm -hmm. you know, when you start taking things to the next stage, you need to make sure you have a solid foundation to, to advance. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I said, right now we're in the Southeast region. Uh, ideally we would like, yeah, we would love to be Pennsylvania wide and, uh, excuse me. And if need be, if something were to happen like in Pittsburgh or Erie or, you know, somewhere that's completely on the opposite spectrum from where we are, uh, we would all collectively travel there, but you know, ideally, we'd like to have guys in that area already. Sure, and, and uh, I think that's that's one of the big things I think we've learned from the recent uh, tornado catastrophes that we've had just a couple weeks ago, mm-hmm. where it was like three weeks in a row we just got bashed with tornadoes, specifically the Midwest. Oh, absolutely! You got you, <laughs> y'all got hammered, man. <laughs> we were um, watching. That was rough. That was rough. I mean, it's hard. It's hard for groups that are established that are so far away to respond to that kind of stuff. On in theory, you know, looking on Instagram, you know, it's easy to say like, "Oh, why, why don't people respond to this kind of stuff more?" But when you're talking, you know, devastation areas that are 12 plus hours away, you know nothing about the area, you know nothing about the people. You know, it's it's hard to logistically plan a response of that sort. And I think having the smaller groups more spread out and you know being familiar with those around you in your region makes those kinds of things easier because if you know the bottom end of your state that's six hours away gets hit with something bad and you know the group that runs that you know section of counties down there you can call them up and you know hey can you give me a sit rep what do you guys need do you even need us to come and it kind of just aids the operational process as a whole which i think a lot of people don't don't always see the bigger picture of yeah 100 percent, man the um the United States is pretty big. <laughs> you can't, it's massive. You can't, you know, it's a couple miles wide. I'll say, so, <laughs> at least seven. At least seven miles. You can't. You're not going to be able to cover the whole thing in, in less than twelve hours. I mean, realistically speaking, if something were to happen on the other side. So, I think a good benefit of like social media and how groups like ours, like the ARA and your group and my group and like the First New England Minutemen up north, uh, we've all done a f- good fair amount of. Uh, PR and, and outreach mm-hmm. and hopefully some people would take inspiration from that that don't have a group like that in their AO and would take the initiative to get their friends together. It, that's all it takes. It started with just me and two other guys. Mm-hmm. And you know, I mean, we're not we're not gigantic, but we are a little bit more organized, a little more structured, and we have you know plans going forward. But that's all it takes is a couple of guys. So I would hope that people who have no group like this in their region would take inspiration from groups like ours and say, you know what, we need something like that here. Uh, you know, sp- <clears throat> excuse me, especially dealing with uh, tornadoes and stuff. Like I used, I grew up in Kansas actually. Oh, okay. And uh, so I saw tornadoes very, very regularly. I saw, I saw the devastation they leave and this recent spat of them in the Midwest where the, uh, the first AEF responded, I believe they did. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they did like a, re- a relief train up there, and that was that was incredible. Those guys, mm-hmm. uh, but like you said, smaller groups spanned out across a wider area, 
networking together, communicating with each other, sharing intel with each other. Uh, th- that's the basis of community building. Mm-hmm, you know, because sure. you're not uh, not to downplay fire, or police, or EMS or anything, but you can't always rely on them to get where they need to be. You know, resources might be limited. They might yeah. just be pulled far too thin. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I'm a, I mean, I'm a fireman and. Mm-hmm. I can tell you that it does not take much to overwhelm an area as far as responding goes. But we can even look uh, to what happened in Mississippi. And, I mean, the the very first area that got hit when this span of tornadoes happened, the majority of that main county that got hit, their, their fire trucks and everything, they were destroyed. I mean, yeah. there's, pic- there's pictures of their fire trucks driving around with broken front windshields and trees stuck in their grills and Jesus, they were destroyed. And and a lot of their firehouses and police stations were also destroyed. Um, And and I think that goes back to one of those big things is, and it's like you just said, you can't always count on even your local government services, you know, being there to provide aid. Yeah. Um, you, You can't, you can't give, you can't let your life be in somebody else's hands. You have to take charge and, you know, be ready in your own area for yourself. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I might be going off on a tangent here, so reel me back as I go. But uh, you know, like I said before, hopefully these, hopefully people spread out will take inspiration from these groups and set up something like this in their area. Because, like as the as the PMR goes, I I hope we're not the only ones uh, coming together like we are in the state. Mm-hmm. And I hope that you know there there are other communities out there that maybe they they're not on social media or whatever, but. You know, we can be an example. We mm-hmm. were just a bunch of guys who came together. We focus on providing certain aspects to the community, and then anybody else sees that and they're like, "It's an example to be taken." So they're like, "Oh, they can do it. We're going to do it." And that's how you build your. That's how you build up everybody around you. And I think that's extremely important, especially like like we we're just talking about with major disasters striking. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's sexy to talk about community defense and fighting the feds one day and fending off the Russian invasion and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, in reality, and I've said it for years with my local guys and years on social media, even back before I got deleted a million times was that (laughs) you're, you're more likely to do something community aid response than you ever are to line up on the street with guns. Oh, for sure. 110%. And you know, it's, it's a shame because a lot of guys and excuse me, I'm, and I'm also guilty of it too. I mean, I'm, I'm not sin free from it, but at one point I was like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to take on the feds, you know, cause I'm full of piss and vinegar. I'm badger. I'm badger. <laughs> I'm going to bite some, <laughs> I'm going to bite some people. But, uh, but after a while you start to let some wisdom sink in, start to let reality sink in. And you're like, all right, what am I more likely to face a down tree crossing my road? That's preventing traffic or maybe slammed into a house mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, a sky full of Russian paras coming down at me. Sure. And that's not to say that, you know, for groups and group members listening that you shouldn't train for community defense and all that kind of stuff. Those are definitely important topics, but every single training event you do shouldn't be the basics of patrolling and, you know, maybe digging some fighting holes and stuff like that. Like there's such a wide variety of topics that have to be covered. Oh yeah, and you don't have enough time in the day, man. Like it's no, there's it never sucks. enough time. <laughs> it's never sucks. enough time. Like by the time you get through one training lesson, it's like oh Jesus! Like what are we gonna do now? <laughs> I could I could I could probably get my guys to train five days a week, and we still wouldn't have enough time to get everything done we need to get done. Even when I was in the army, we didn't have enough time, and that was my full time job. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's that's one of the most frustrating parts is when you do find yourself in an organized group with good SOPs and a good training regimen and a good group of guys that you want to just take on more and more and more and more. And there's just, there's never enough funds and there's never enough time. You get, you got to know your limits. You know, you you really, you really got to know your limits. Um, Like (laughs) when it goes, same thing when it comes to food, you know, your, your eyes might be bigger than your stomach. You know, you, you might see something and think, Oh, I can handle that. That's no problem. But the second you start biting into it, you're like, man, I'm, I'm full. <laughs> I can't. Mm-hmm. I can't handle it all. Sure. So, same thing when it comes to these types of responsibilities. You know, start small. You know, organize a park cleanup. Just get together and do something that actually benefits. Volunteer. You know, volunteer at shelters for fire companies, things like that. Take an active role. Those are small things you can do, but it's you're actually doing something. You're not just mm-hmm. you know talking for online clout. Yeah. 
and help and help each other out too. Um, you know, I, your group as a whole should also be as, as cheesy it is to say online. It is your tribe. <laughs> it is your community. I mean, you know, help guys, you know, go over and help them do that landscaping, you know, you know, help them do X, Y, Z, help the guy move. Like, you know, hey, spend time together, help each other out, pick each other up, you know, do that kind of stuff. Cause that kind of stuff, you know, matters in the long scheme as well. Oh, for sure, man. It go it goes such a long way, you know, especially, and I keep talking about, it, but going back to the military, you know, if, when you're young and stupid and you go out drinking and you just say, ah, man, I can't drive. Got to call one of your buddies, come pick your stupid ass up. So, okay. oh yeah. <laughs> and the same principle goes here. We got guys in different areas and, Let's say, you know, we, we kind of adapted this policy uh, recently, but if something were to happen and you're stranded, you're going to call your the guy closest to you. And, mm-hmm. you know, he's agreed, to, uh, yeah, I, I got you no matter what time. Sure. So try to help uh, each other out. So another question that got asked on the, the Instagram poll was, uh, how big is too big? Just speaking in terms of, you know, group size or area of influence, you know, in general, what is, what is, what do you consider as too big? Oh, that's a, that's a difficult one to answer. Yeah. I would say, I honestly, <clears throat> I gotta be careful how I word this. I don't know if there is such a thing as too big of a group, but mm-hmm. it's, it's all in how you manage and delegate. Sure. You know, it's because, uh, a Fortune 500 company could be considered too big, but they they understand from the top down how to manage their tasks day to day, and how to delegate certain responsibilities. So, I believe that that applies to any group, uh, whether you're three guys or you're three thousand guys deep. You know, as long as you have a good management structure and you have a good set of delegation, different guys have different responsibilities, and you know, uh, I believe that. Uh, that's a dynamic management style is to allow that uh, delegation to assist in growth. I don't think you can get too big. It's a matter of how fast you grow. I think that's a damaging factor. Um, if you grow too fast, you're very likely to burn out. But so growing, I, yeah, growing big, sorry. <laughs> my personal opinion on it is to some extent there is no such thing as too big. And I think it depends on – well, I think there has to be a very, very serious reason as to if you've gotten so big, you ask yourself, are we too big? There has to be a really serious cause to call for getting that big mm-hmm. um, in a sense. But but for me, like I think about it in sense of response times in a sense. So let's say you have set up you know, a cluster of 10 counties and from the furthest county to the furthest county, it's let's say it's a two and a half uh, hour drive. To, to me, in my mind, if you're if it takes you more than two hours to get to the absolute other side of your AO, space wise, to me, I feel like you're getting too big. Now that could change depending on your numbers. If you've got ten guys over an entire state that's six hours from one end to the other, that doesn't really do you any good. But mm-hmm. if you've got you know. 12 dudes on this side of the state and on the northern end of the state you've got 14 dudes and on the eastern side of the state you've got 16 dudes and somewhere around the middle you've got another group of 12 to 14 dudes like if you're talking about you know good sized groups of guys it's a little easier to manage but if the closest if the closest guy to you is over an hour away i mean at what point are you really a true response effort and i think about it from the operational perspective of that no that's a very very good point i mean if you if you're talking spatially speaking, yeah, if you're spread out far too thin and you don't have the numbers, you need to you need to tighten up your AO. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. If you have the numbers to spread out proportionally and within reason, that's a smarter way to go. Like you said, cover all angles, north, south, east, and west. And uh, you could hit any part of the state within a very reasonable amount of time and coordinate any kind of efforts a lot easier than trying to haul 10 dudes six hours across, you know, one direction (laughs) Mm -hmm. makes a simple phone call. That's about it. And I also think it's another one of those things where if both, if your, if your general AO or your space is somewhat limited, you actually develop a sense of place and community when you do actually have to do stuff, whether it's through volunteer events or actually some sort of response or something like actually kind of develop a sense of, 
presence and relationship with, with where you are. If you're just 10 dudes from Texas and you're in every corner of Texas, like you don't really have a foothold. Right. But if, but if it's like, hey, we're the top 50 miles of Texas and there's 10 of us, that's a little different. Now you you know the people in those communities and you know your AO and all that kind of stuff. So, And d- some people will have different opinions um, of what they consider is, is too much AO. But for me, it's like, how can I efficiently implement my guys in a response or operation based on what I'm working with and how much space I have to cover? Absolutely. And <clears throat> being tighter in your community too, being uh, being present, you know, establishing a presence includes, in my opinion, getting to know your local authorities, getting to know your local governments. I'm not talking like your your state government. I'm talking your local municipalities. Mm-hmm. Like, how many people do you think know their mayors, or at least <laughs> know of them? You know, how many people know their uh, their city councilmen? Mm-hmm. You know, these are the people that make decisions that directly impact you you know the president makes decisions uh and they can impact you but the people on your municipal level they make decisions every day that could impact your township could impact your your hell your house taxes you know or your your home your living taxes depending on your state but you should get you should uh, make it a habit to try and know these people let them uh, let them know your presence and do it in a respectful manner don't just spook them because that's I don't think that's uh, productive at all, spooking them. And even more so than that, you know, businesses and whatnot. Yeah. Probably even more. You know, do you know some local farmers? Do you know the old guy that runs the gun shop in town? Do you know some? Do you have some friends in the ER and at the hospital? You know, there's there's so much to it. You know, when we say community, we mean community, not just who benefits me the most and that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely you know. There's a, there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts to it. It's not just uh, – it's more than just guns. Yeah, and, and one guy can't do it all. I can't know everybody in town. No. You got to know guys on your side of the town and I guys on my side of the town and you know you guys in that county over there and you're not going to know everybody. Everybody no. might know you, but you don't know everybody. Your head will explode. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, another question. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> tips tips for vetting new guys. What are some vetting tips you got for guys? <sighs> vetting tips. Oh, boy. Okay, let's see. So this this was a this was a bit of a hot button issue in our group. Mm-hmm. We basically came to the conclusion that we're not going to be able to 100% thoroughly vet people as we would like to. We're, mm-hmm. We don't have the resources to do that. Um but honestly, what we're implementing, at least this year in our recruitment cycle, uh, implementing a, a standard criminal background check, mm. which, uh, you know, it's part of our it's part of our uh, requirements is you can't have any uh, felonies or violent misdemeanors. So I would suggest, <clears throat> excuse me, implementing some kind of a, a background check as part of your membership, um, especially in the realm of like what we are training to do. Mm-hmm. And not just the civil defense side, but like emergency response, we're going to potentially be working with, you know, pulling people out of situations in vulnerable states. I want to make sure that each one of the guys on the teams that's taking part in that is not some guy who's going to do something, you know, <laughs> unbecoming. Uh, so I would recommend a uh, just a basic back uh, criminal background check and a child abuse background check. Uh, Pennsylvania, we uh, we do them for medical practitioners and anybody in first response. Um, when I was in law enforcement, I used to be a firefighter as well. Uh, we also had, you know, standard criminal background checks and uh, child abuse checks, because nice. you know. So that's that would be my first tip is to <clears throat> implement that. There there may be like depending on what service you use, twenty five to thirty dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're not, they're not. Pardon me. <clears throat> oh my goodness. Uh, so they're not too terrible. Uh, to for uh, cost wise another one I would ask some very obscure questions if you're going to interview these people Um, one habit I got into especially with some of the uh, people I've worked with in the past uh, like for for jobs and in the military uh, they would ask me very very obscure questions things I had nothing to do with the you know nothing pertaining to the job that I was looking for Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was to just kind of see how my mind worked 
And if I gave some really off the wall answer, something that just, that was, <laughs> it would be an immediate red flag if you didn't answer a certain way. But, you know, don't, don't be afraid to think outside the box when you're asking people questions. If you ask somebody like, if you could be any fruit, what would you be? You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. If people are gonna be like, uh, that's stupid. You don't even want to play along. But I would definitely implement background checks, ask obscure, ask obscure questions in your interviews, and uh, just test these people, man. See if their heart's really in it. That's that's part of our recruitment process. You know, we we have an application that's getting ready to be presented here in a little bit. Um, we interview people face to face. We have criminal background checks done. We have a fitness test in place, and we also have a final assessment in place because we want guys who come into this to come into this with the right mindset, the right heart, and for the right reasons. So if you have any standards in place and guys are trying to subvert them or, you know, jam out of them, uh, they're, they're not cut out for you then. It, their heart's not in, in it. Might sound, no, I... might sound a little bit uh, – uh, you know, high headedness, but that's that's just how we view it, and it's been working for us so far. My first big thing for everybody is one: not everybody is a damn fed, <laughs> but two. <laughs> yes, they every, are, Jeremy. <laughs> everybody is a fed until they're not, <laughs> and that may be confusing to everybody. But uh, the internet is entirely too paranoid about everybody being feds. Yep, there's not enough feds for everybody to be feds. Now, with that being said, treat everybody as a fair fed until you know that they are not. Um, but you can't just shut out the world or shut out recruiting or just refuse to have any part in all of it just because you're afraid that one guy one day may be a fed. I mean, you've you got to get out there. You've got to talk to people. You've got to meet people. It's just – it's a part of the game. That's – I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> that was also a big issue when we were first – first getting started that was an issue we observed in other groups as well uh when we were first getting started was uh, like everybody is a fed is a psyop straight up you sure. know you know and and everybody's paranoid and you're supposed to be in out a community outreach group and you're afraid to interact with your community because you think you know 92 year old 92 year old little miss betty down the street is you know a cia operative or something you know it's it's not the case and even and the simple fact is, even if a Fed does show up to one of your trainings, like we had a medical training last month, and I'm pretty sure a couple of those guys were legitimate Feds. Uh, okay, well they learned how to use a tourniquet properly. <laughs> they learned how to put on a chest seal. You know, you're not doing anything illegal. You shouldn't be doing anything illegal. Um, say for February and March, uh, we did gardening and homesteading trainings. I made a ball. We have you, training blocks, and since terrorist. that's right before spring, we did a lot of gardening stuff, like seed starting and like plant care and all that. Yeah. So if, if a Fed, for whatever reason, ever did show up to one of our trainings, they'd be like, these dudes are just gardening. <laughs> just hardcore gardening. <laughs> these dudes are literally starting seeds as prac app. <laughs> these guys are building firing positions. No, we're just we're building sunflower beds. <laughs> uh, it's, but it's, it's, it's the truth, though, man. Like These guys that show up... like. Even if they are feds, who, who gives a damn? <laughs> They're going to learn a new skill and th that'll be it. So we stopped doing like big meet and greet style recruiting events. Not specifically for the fed reason, but it is kind of a good way against that. Like I like recruiting guys on a one on one basis. Normally I take another guy with me. So like two on one. Sure. Like I want to go meet you as an individual. I don't want to have to try and feel you out in a group amongst like eight other new guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. For me, that always works. Like, if I've got a guy that messages me on Instagram or something like that, it's like, hey, I'm also from your area. I'm looking for dudes to train with, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, cool. Let's go get lunch. <laughs> When's your lunch break? Let's go get dinner. Let's just yep. let's literally go sit down and eat eat a damn chicken sandwich together, and let's just hang out for a minute. Um, and it could be super awkward because some people are just super awkward. As, as much of a personable and friendly person as I am, it can be awkward. Um but any time that a new guy comes into the fold, if they're not a personal like recommendation from somebody that's already in the group, I always just go meet them one on one before they ever come anywhere near a training event, and just like you said, just ask them questions, feel them out, just see where their see where their head is at. Um, obviously, I do big try to do big um, overlooks on like their social media and stuff like that. 
Mm-hmm. You know, if, if it's a guy with three pictures and his account is nine days old, that's a little sketchy. <laughs> but if his account is seven years old and you can see his high school graduation pictures on his profile, like you've probably got less to be concerned about. Yeah. I, I'm, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm just, I'm so over the whole, everybody's a fed thing. And like, I, I don't understand what, you're sp- take back your American fighting spirit, damn it. <laughs> yeah, I don't give a damn. That's what I'm saying. Like, stop being afraid of the Fed. There's two guys in our state, and, and none of them, they're, neither of them are competent. Like, th- their names are Bob and Joe. <laughs> and they, they spill coffee on each other regularly, probably. This, this brings me into another question somebody else asked, kind of getting out of vetting a little faster. But mm-hmm. um, it's how to convince guys that organizing is a good thing. Oh, how, how would I convince guys? Yeah, because, I mean, I don't know about you. I mean, I've had even just personal guys in my life before that's like they're all about it in a sense, but, like, they don't want to come to a training or they're like, ah, you know, I I do things with the girlfriend on Saturdays. Like, I just can't ever do. Like, I could never come to a training or it's sure. like, ah, blah, 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 blah. It's like how do you convince guys to really do the stuff? Well, uh, that's a good question. I would say one approach we took was uh, just tell them straight up. You know, these the skills that we're going to be working on are beyond the gun stuff. You know, beyond shooting, beyond patrols, beyond all the the Rambo hua shit. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we're we're learning team building exercises. We're building trust. We're building a network of people you can count on should things go wrong. Like, yes, sure, you have your individual families, and you should. You should be there for them. That, that comes first. It goes without saying. But you should also be working on networking with like-minded individuals mm-hmm. who have a common goal, who share common values, and want to build together, want to grow together. Because this is a lonely-ass world if you have no friends. <laughs> you sure. Know? And it's it's one thing to have friends. It's another thing to have guys you can count on if things go haywire. Like, mm-hmm. And I'm not saying like somebody – knocking down your door like trying to take you let's say your house burns down you know and and you don't have the finances to to bounce back from that you have no other connections possibly well fortunately if you have a network of guys you potentially have somebody like hey dude yeah you guys come crash in my house till you guys get your your shit back on track you know that's a bit of a drastic example but i'm saying if it ever came to that if you build up that trust over time you build up that camaraderie and that essentially brotherhood with each other you'll be with each other through anything you know and that's that's the that's the important thing so if I, if I need to convince you that it's worth it then it's it's not worth it to you <laughs> you know it's not worth my time one big thing with me is that whether a guy has maybe not necessarily doubts but just isn't super consistent with Tra- coming to trainings or doesn't know if they want to fully commit as it is and so on and so forth is one are, are you providing a good moral reason for them to be to be doing this in the first place are you as a, a person in a leadership position guiding your guys and, and providing you know that sense of purpose um, and secondly are your trainings f- fulfilling you know do do they feel like the trainings are important or they just they feel like it's just walking through the motion, so on and so forth? But that goes back to another one of the things. If every training is just you doing a patrol, hmm. the guys are gonna get burnt out and be like, Okay, this is I've been doing this for three <laughs> months, this is dumb. Yeah, so to your to your first point, I do try to motivate the guys. Uh, we try to motivate each other really. Uh, I might be in a leadership position administratively, but I look to everybody for for uh, motivation. We look to each other. You know, the the core group of guys we have right now, which is our whole team, our hearts are in it, and we're hoping to bring more guys on it whose hearts are in the right place. When it comes to cutting the time out, we have a training schedule out to a year, so we know when each training is. It's it's you know it's uh, it's very regimented, so you know a year in advance if you can make it or not, or, or you know when they're going to be. So there's really no excuse like, Oh, I just, the training just popped up. Like, no, it didn't. You knew about this nine months ago, mm-hmm. but if something were to come up, you know, it's, that's different. <clears throat> but as far as motivation goes, uh, we do talk to each other. We do motivate each other. And I feel like I'm rambling. What was your second part of your question? Uh, I think my second part of the point was, um, oh, are your sure. training, are your trainings 
yeah, meaningful and fulfilling. Uh, yes, actually, they are. We try to keep everything on point. We do try to have a general outline of what we want to accomplish, uh, like what we're going to do, a general timeline. Um, Your videos are super cool. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, That's most of it, really. <laughs> Spielberg, uh, he came out one time and... <laughs> Yeah, he was cool. Officially first PMR affiliated. Yeah, yeah. We're sponsored by MGM. (laughs) Yeah, Spielberg's our machine gunner. Uh, New t-shirt idea. (laughs) No, but uh, we do feel uh, that our our training days are pretty fulfilling. And uh, we actually have a pretty decent project we just discussed today. Uh, That's going to be an ongoing project for us. And that's going to be ultimately when when it's completed... I think for the group as a whole is going to be a very step back moment and go, wow, we did this together. Like that's going to be a, a milestone for us once, once it's completed. It's nothing terrifying. I don't want to give anybody the idea. It's not a fucking dirty bomb. It's, it's something completely innocuous. Trust me. But, uh, as a group, the project as a whole, uh, I believe will be very fulfilling. The trainings day to day, they are without a doubt. Um, we do, like I said, we do. I feel like I'm rambling again. Good lord. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stop myself there. <laughs> We're the good. Coffee's getting to me. You're good. Do you drink coffee at nine o'clock at night, dude? I I drink pre workout before I go to the gym at like nine thirty. Man, I'm up till four, and then I'm back at it at seven. <laughs> yeah, I don't do like late night gym times unless I absolutely have to, just because that reason. I don't. I don't need to be wired all night. I like my early bedtime, so I'm an old man. Well, you just got to work out properly and, you know, lift lightweight all day. No, no, no. <laughs> lift heavyweight all the time. Nah, lightweight, this baby, ain't nothing but a peanut. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. I love it. Uh, anyway, uh, so copycat Instagram groups. I was, this was another special request. Copycats. You guys had to deal with copycat Instagram groups? Copycat groups. Like, uh, oh, oh. I, I, I know what you mean. Um, so we haven't had to necessarily deal with any groups, uh, but we did observe quite a few pop up. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously you have the first PMR, us. You have the, yep. f- the first New England Minutemen up north, the f- first Allied Expeditionary Force down in the, uh, I believe, the Georgia region, mm-hmm. or down, so, somewhere down the south. Uh, all the all of us have the the nomenclature first at the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't put that there because it was we were the first ones in the state. We we chose that because it was a callback to the first Pennsylvania regiment. It was an actual military unit. Mm-hmm. Um, but we didn't, you know. So when we started we started seeing all these other random pop up groups, uh, like the first North Carolina something or other first. So Kansas Pathfinders, which I thought was cool, man. I thought we sparked a movement. I was like, oh, sweet. Like, we got, you know, people all over. I thought it was a wave of inspiration. Mm-hmm. So I was genuinely excited. But then I started seeing some really weird stuff. I'm like, wait, wait a minute. What is, what's what's going on? And then it started to become meme worthy. Uh, I'm hesitant to say any actual group names. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there was one regarding feet. Or fe- oh feedy footies <laughs> in Alabama, and I was like, "Like these guys are legit Delta Force, without a doubt." Um, no, but these gr- these groups popped up, and I was initially excited, but then once I saw that they were just kind of copy and pasting the same mantra, mm-hmm. but not really doing anything, mm-hmm. I, they they fizzled out within probably a month, if that, mm-hmm. and it. It was kind of disheartening. I was like, oh, okay, I guess these guys were just part of the fad because social media is nothing but a fad. Sure. You know, and that's 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 a separate topic. But the, to us, building the PMR isn't a fad. To us, like, we're in it. Like, this this is, like, <laughs> in our minds, we are assigned to the first PMR. We are here to accomplish a mission, and that's that. Mm-hmm. These other These other groups that kind of just sprung up and then burned out, seemed like they were just hopping on a on a trend wave and that was pretty disheartening to see Mm -hmm. but yeah yeah there's definitely definitely trend hoppers but i mean that's that's true with anything oh sure you know like plates nods you i mean you name any piece of gear a specific piece of recce (laughs) recce i can't wait for the recce comeback 
Dude, uh, I can't wait for the Gulf War aesthetic to just swing back full. <laughs> I'm, I'm so ready for it. <laughs> um, last silly question that's on the list here. Why don't you do overnighters? I was told this is an inside joke. <laughs> Let me guess. That was from New England. <laughs> I think I, th- I think it was. I can't remember who it was. Let me look back at my Instagram while you explain why you don't do overnighters, Badger. First of all, because we're old. We're old men. <laughs> now we, we, God damn it, we haven't. We've done overnights. Um, it's just a matter of scheduling on our parts, trying to dedicate weekends to it. Like we all have families, work lives. Insert excuse here. We're still trying to work in our schedules. Uh, next year, we are planning to incorporate an additional, uh, either one or two additional uh, overnighters, FTXs. Um, yeah, <laughs> New England. I know I know exactly who asked that, too. It, it was not New England. It wasn't? No. Oh, that's interesting. It was, it was the Fed in your group. <laughs> He's going to be like, I'm not a Fed. I didn't ask that. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, yeah it's overnighters. Yeah, scheduling. <laughs> Yeah, overnighters can be hard. We have a couple we do a year. But, I mean, if you're doing more than three or four overnighters a year, like true overnighters, like yeah. training overnighters, not like, hey, we went camping and just, like, hung out. No, like, if you're doing, like, serious training overnighters, that's a he- that's a heavy schedule. It's exhausting, too. Like it's It a, is. You know, especially, it's- <laughs> especially for the guy that plans out all these trainings. Oh, like we did our spring FTX, which was only like 26 hours, and it was an overnighter. And like, it took me a month to plan this thing out. Yeah, it's not a small task. No, yeah, you're you're not you're you're not a, a company size element with an entire headquarters unit <laughs> with you know training topics split up amongst an entire team that's dedicated to, to training. This is a overnighters are a lot it requires a lot of logistics and if you've got a lot of dudes like if you're a group of like five dudes it's easy to plan an overnighter but if you're at 10 plus guys you know especially over 20 guys trying to get everybody on board for an overnighter specifically multiple overnighters a year when you're depending on how much you're training you know i don't know about you know pmr but i mean we're having several trainings a month so i mean it's it's a lot on the schedule Oh, absolutely. And the reason we don't do many overnighters is because S1 denied all of our paperwork. That's why. That's reasonable. Yeah, yeah. It keeps getting kicked kicked back. back Yeah, man. (laughs) Sergeant Major refuses to sign off on it. I'm like, oh, my God. It's just, you know, we never get to field time. but S3 and S4 can't get their shit straight. All these S's, man. Then S6 loses our radios halfway through. You know. Then my leave got pulled. I got CQ the next day. I can't do it. Damn. It sucks. But... (laughs) <laughs> um, no, but we do, we do have a, a yearly FTX. We have um, next year on our training schedule, we're looking to implement a couple more overnighters for sure. Mm-hmm. And they're they're not just camping. You know, like our last one wasn't just a camping outing. Like that shit was straight exhaust. I was dead by the time we were done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like physically, I, I got to change out my boots because my feet felt like they were straight cinder blocks by the time I got back to my car. I was walking like like Frankenstein's monster. Um, but there are a lot of work. I mean, anybody who's actually gone in the field to accomplish anything knows there are a lot of work, oh, yeah. um, uh, beyond the planning. I mean, I just mean physically, and that just might be me personally bitching about it, but that's fine. I don't care. Um, <laughs> I'll bitch <laughs> about it. I'll bitch about it in the field while I'm doing it. Um, next question, special consent. I'm not sure what, not exactly <clears throat> sure what they meant by this question. Mm-hmm. It's actually one of my guys. Special considerations for civilian teams. I don't know if that means special roles or just like general considerations for like a civilian fire team. Let's let's go let's go just general like rifleman considerations first. You know, what are some some basics that you kind of look to when you guys are like this is the base of all units, which is the fire team. Some people will say it's the buddy pair, but I'm not going all the way down to two people, folks. The fire team. That <laughs> it's is the, the base. Single man element. Come on yeah. now. <laughs> One guy. That's that's the bottom of the pyramid. It's me. I'm the team. I, I am the unit. <laughs> I'm the absolute unit. I am um, God. So so I, I I don't think I understand the question fully. Like so I I'll, I'll rephrase it in this sense. Mm. What are some general considerations operationally and logistically do you consider for a civilian rifleman team? And if you need to, I can kind of answer it first. 
Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I, I already feel like an idiot for trying to process as my hamster's running at full speed. You're good. So <laughs> for me, the way the way I take the question as I just asked it is, you know, what if if you're talking about our base civilian team, like this is the standard in the group, some mm. considerations I would take in, into um, to thought is, can that fire team operate independently if need be? And that means, can they sustain themselves for what the standard amount of time is? Like, let's say your response gear SOP says you should be able to sustain yourself for 72 hours. Can that team sustain themselves for 72 hours? Are Mm -hmm. they capable of accomplishing what you consider as your base curriculum? They know, you know, five basic reports that you teach. They understand the basics of comms. They know March, um, you know, so on and so forth. You know, so to me is... And I think it gets overlooked a lot because right now the trend is kind of specialty roles in teams. Yeah. Is are you at the very base of your entire organization, do you have well-established, well-trained riflemen fire teams? I would say, uh, well, we can't be trained enough. I'll I'll say that right off the bat. For sure. Um, we, we are competent. I believe we're competent. There's always things we can improve on. Communications, at least when it comes to uh, uh, like radio work. Mm-hmm. Definitely a lot of ground to cover on that alone. Um, we know the basics. Uh, we have uh, a few guys who are very knowledgeable in, um, in a variety of, if, of fields. Uh, and unfortunately, we do try, like regardless of our time limits, we do try to maximize how much time we – or how, mu- how much uh, – uh, training we cover in the in that span of time, um, but I believe we do have the basics covered. I mean, we do have a general understanding of of radio communications. You know, at least how etiquette goes. Um, you know, don't just say, "Hey, Bob, it's me. I'm shot." You know. Uh, let's see. Looking back on it now, like reflecting, I think there's a. Uh, well, I'll, I'll be honest. There's a lot of room for improvement, for sure. Sure. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a really good, interesting question. Like that's that's giving me. I'm writing that down as a matter of fact. Well, I think uh, so to uh, reflect. And I on think that. that's just something that a lot of guys overlook in general is is at the base, and maybe it's just the marine, but but is at the base <laughs> everybody a rifleman? And the answer to your question is no. Not every marine is a damn rifleman. If I hear somebody say that again, I'm gonna lose my shit. <laughs> a lot of them are, are nowhere near that. However. <laughs> Do from our perspective, are your guys, you know, well versed in the basics? You can't you can't be sniper teams, you can't be <laughs> drone teams, and you can't be you know these counter intel teams if at the very basis your guys are not good at the basics. I'll say this. I'll say this. Our guys are like I said before. They're very competent uh, in every field that we train. They do have a, a grasp of the basics right now, and we're building on top of that. I'll end on that. Awesome. And that's the thing is you're is you're always building. You know, sure. as you get, bring in new guys because we don't bring in new guys in like blocks. We bring in new guys as they come. Mm-hmm. Not everybody's gonna be on the same page. My guy that has spent thousands and thousands of dollars in kit and gone to multiple classes and has been in the group for two years is gonna be on a whole different level than the guy that's been in the group for two months and he still hasn't updated his plate carrier. Like they're just, they're, they're going to be on two completely different ball fields. And oh, that's for okay. sure. And that's okay. And that's part of having the citizenry groups is that just it's made up of everyday people. You you don't have professional soldiers and full-time guys training and all that. Like you have what you have. So now can you implement effectively what you do have? Exactly. And like you just said, we, we're we're not big enough to have specialty teams right now. Every guy is tra- trained in a general uh, breadth of skill sets that are effective to what we're trying to accomplish. And whatever the topic is for that day, it, whoever has the most experience in that field will lead the training, mm-hmm. regardless of their their quote unquote position in the group or their time in group. Um, if they, I'm not going to deny somebody an opportunity to spread knowledge just because they've only been in the group about a week, but they're mm-hmm. extremely knowledgeable on uh, specific types of communication. You know, I've, anybody who has knowledge is very welcome to take over and, and, and instruct as they see fit. Sure. And, you know, you can't know everything. 
my guys joke about it all the time because I always say I was like because I always say that I'm like guys you know one guy can't know everything we all got to contribute and they're like but yep. you do know everything and I'm like no <laughs> no I don't <laughs> don't say that you know so but, much but you know yeah it, it take everybody has something to contribute and that's one of the big things kind of go back to recruiting that I always hit on is that everybody contributes to the group in some yep. way form or fashion you may not know anything super tactical but hey maybe you have um, you know, some ham radio experience, or maybe you have a piece of property that is an option for us to train on now, or maybe you have a bunch of medical gear because your parents are vets. So you got a, like a bunch of stocks of extra stuff and whatnot, like whatever it might be. Like, well, dude, every- one of our guys, he, he wasn't in the military, wasn't prior any kind of tactical anything. He's a good shooter. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's as far as like his tactical expertise goes, but he's an experienced hunter. And he's, you know, dressed game and stuff like that, cleaned it and everything. And he's offering to teach uh, the group how to properly do it. Because I've never hunted. I was always a fisherman. Mm-hmm. So I've never had to, you know, gut a deer and, and wear its skin in a tribal ritual. Uh, so That'd I don't know. Cool. I think that's how hunting goes. I don't know. But <laughs> he's offering to uh, take the whole group up to an area and teach us how to properly dress and clean a a piece of game and i'm like yeah that's a really vital fucking skill like uh, personally i don't know anybody except maybe two guys who know how to do that and they're old family so my guy and my guys asked about that this past hunting season they're like we show us how to skin a deer because a lot of them don't know and i was like yeah sure but then you know i shoot a deer and it's snowing out and i'm like okay well how do i get all the guys to my house before i need to skin <laughs> this deer and it just didn't work out it's like i can't just leave this deer till tuesday when everybody can come over <laughs> like it's got to get cleaned at home now it's got to capture it live you got to do it live <laughs> yeah just kill it in the garage with a knife <laughs> just fist fight it man that's yeah. that's that's the way god intended just beat I'll it jump to death. out of the tree and grab it by its antlers <laughs> just suplex it, to the it straight to hell <laughs> yeah um so I guess this question, this next question was kind of inspired by your most recent po- uh, post, uh, engineer roles and implementing uh, engineer tasks. Mm. So, uh, like I said before, we don't really have specific uh, specialty roles right now. Uh, we have guys who specialize in more uh, or specialize more in certain areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we had a, a guy come on who, like, say, was an engineer, that would be fantastic. You know, because uh, he would be able to instruct us on proper ways to construct certain things. Like we would love to, uh, w- when we go out in the woods, we want to start building things, and that's actually what our group project is. It's we're going to be constructing something, but we we don't want the roof to cave in on us. You know what I mean? So if we had somebody with uh, engineering expertise, and even a combat engineer would be superb, uh, because we would like to learn how to you know properly construct roadblocks do area denial, things like that. Not just for like, uh, you know, the feds reason, but in a disaster, you might need to barricade some area to stop people from going down a flooded road or something, you know, mm-hmm. or sandbag a road to, uh, to, uh, redirect water flow, something like that. Yeah. Engineers come in and uh, people love to make fun of engineers. Oh, dude, they're, they're gold. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're useful in so many applications. I mean, Absolutely. If, especially like the more conventional aspect. If you need some serious defenses built for like a more fortified, for for a more like a static area, like a command and control, like a COC or something. Yeah. Engineers come in with some heavy equipment, a bunch of dudes that just hate life and whatnot. <laughs> they get those, they get those defenses dug real fast. They have or, to hate life. Or, you know, you need some infrastructure built or anything like that. I mean, engineers are uh, extremely useful. They're critical, I would say. They're, I mean, Especially when we look at, like, the community, uh, like, disa- natural disaster response side of all of this. Yeah. If you've got some guys that are in engineer roles, like, more officially in the group, and maybe they're, you know, they're blue-collar guys in real life. They got some bobcats at home because they're farm boys or they have, you know, any type of equipment. You bring that kind of stuff on, like, a natural disaster response, you know, you're a you're a citizen group that showed up with a bobcat. Now you're helping clear somebody's uh, yeah. property up and whatnot. Like I mean, that kind of stuff really helps people. People remember that kind of stuff. Dude, that resonates, man. The second you show up with heavy equipment and you're starting to pull, you know, trees off of houses or something, or you know, you're you're tying a winch to a car, pull it out of a ditch after it flooded out or something like that. You know, yeah, like you said, people remember that stuff, and that leaves a lasting impact. Like. 
these guys came when I when I needed, you know, when I was in trouble and they they helped me. So that's one big thing we train on a few times a year is vehicle recovery. And mm. as part of our SOPs, um, we have a vehicle recovery kit built out by one of our guys that's like a rigger. Huh. Nice. Um, and so the SOP has, you know, everything you need to recover a vehicle and some basic maintenance stuff to do like on the side of the road, basically for, you know, rescuing your own vehicles in operation. Or if you're in that natural disasters type scenario, pull guys out of ditches, whether it's cold weather, you know, post flood, like anything like that, you know, just having some of those basics that even just your guys that aren't specialty roles is able to do such as, you know, hook straps up to somebody and pull them out of a ditch or pull them out of, you know, some heavy water or something like that. Um, you know, that, that kind of stuff makes a big difference as well. It's important skills, man. And definitely. Um, are there any other, I know you said that you don't have any implemented right now, but uh, I had quite a few responses on just specialty roles, question mark. Um, so what are some things if you guys were to start, you know, implementing this stuff, what are some big roles you think guys should focus on, you know, first that really increases the group capabilities? Oh boy. That's a big question. Um, Oh man, honestly, I think, I think what what you just covered is a, is a crucial aspect that everybody overlooks, Mm -hmm. you know, being able to self rescue or like, like at the moment I drive a lot on the road. I'm constantly on the road. So I see crashes every five feet, you know, just cars flying all over the place. It's ridiculous. So if, somebody like me had the option or not the option, had the uh, chance to help somebody out. Mm -hmm. I think that would, I think that would go leaps and bounds, uh, not only in the public eye, but also just to help your group to be that, like to have everybody outfitted like that, being able to self rescue or being able to come together and assist in a big way. I think that would be the most crucial thing you could do or the most likely thing to be used at at the very least. Mm -hmm. Uh, a big thing for me that I've realized recently to like the true extent that it's needed is a communications officer. Yes. It's not, it's not sexy. It's nothing like that. But I mean, having a guy whose sole independent job it is, is to oversee, you know, what frequencies, bands, and encryption are individual units using in the field right now. How is that being rotated? what channels and freaks are assigned to what units, but then also looking at long distance comms and getting to uh, HF and NVIS and stuff like that. And then, you know, you're talking about maybe uh, signal intelligence and counter intel, you know, scanning and directional finding and all that kind of stuff. And just having a guy whose sole job it is to do that stuff is, is huge. Cause like for me right now, I'm doing it also from the leadership perspective and it's yeah, a lot it adds, to the plate. <laughs> it adds a lot to the plates. Yeah. Um, I mean, comms is huge, especially when you move away from Balfangs. Like, if you're a group that just runs Balfangs, you know, I'm not completely dogging on you, but like, that's that's you know, it's whatever. But if you're a group that runs mobile radios and you guys have upgraded to like digital portables, and you're trying to get into long distance comms, so you can talk to further groups, and you're trying to scan and. It's a lot. I mean, see, it is a task. See, the problem is, and, and feel free to disagree with me, and everybody's probably going to be up in arms, but you guys and I'm your fancy – pistol. Yep, yep. You and your fancy radios. Nope, I'm not going to do it. You need to overlook <laughs> Dixie cups and a string. I'm telling you, there's nothing better. <laughs> Nobody can eavesdrop on you. It's perfect. You don't even so, need encryption. So, I mean, jokes aside, one thing that me and some of my guys have talked about recently is field phones. Yeah, that was a that was a God. Where did I saw that pop up somewhere? I forget who who shared that, but Brent O three thirty one talks about it a lot. Yes, that's what. Yeah. Love that so guy's channel. Love it. Of course, you uh, do. Ooh, 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 whatever uh, whatever you guys say. <laughs> um. <laughs> um, but field phones, uh, I think they are still. You know, could be very, a valuable asset. Yeah, very valuable assets. Um, you're not going to be able to you know just ditch radios as a whole and just use field phones and just run wire everywhere, but like. <laughs> You just know, piles like, of copper. <laughs> like, yeah, just an entire, you know, cargo truck just full of wire <laughs> that you constantly have to cut to different lengths because whatever. But, um, like, what Brent talked about recently in his most recent YouTube video was, like, 
you know, if you have a patrol base set up somewhere, or maybe even like a small talk that's overseeing a larger operation, um, you know, running a field phone to like the LPOP instead of increasing your, uh, uh, you know, your RF uh, signal by using portables, you know, that mm-hmm. hundred yards to that LPOP, that that could be a very crucial, you know, uh, opsec uh, approach to take is is using a field phone. That's definitely something we're going to discuss with our comms guy. We do have a, a guy who's uh, he's basically dedicated to comms now. It's <laughs> we kind of threw him into the role because he's he showed his hand as being very smart with it. So we're like, yeah, you're the guy. <laughs> so we're, I need one. I need yeah. one so bad. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he's he's got a lot on his plate right now, but uh, he's he's pretty competent with that stuff. Um, I was very shocked that we we lucked out with with snagging him. Um, but uh, field phones have definitely been discussed in the group uh, as a just another part of the pace plan, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would love to get one of those old, like, 1980 Soviet, <laughs> just six-foot-tall block radios that they would just stash inside tanks or something. I don't know. Carry that around with me, you know. I think that would be uh, the next fad. I've talked about it on prior episodes of this podcast and, like, the Civil Sentinel podcast that I went into and whatnot, but – you know, comms equipment on the civilian end is hard because the oh, stuff, because yeah. one, the tech on the civilian market is already somewhat limited as it is, at least for those of us that are trying to implement it in like the conventional sense that we once did. Um, but if, and the stuff that will work with how you're trying to implement it, depending on what you're trying to do, is extremely expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's, it like, runs in the thousands easily, like on oh, the yeah. low end. Like, our big project right now is man packs. Oh, that's not a bad idea. Um, however, you know, HF man packs is not necessarily secure on the civilian end because HF, encrypted HF and whatnot on the civilian side either costs you thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars or just does not exist. So then you start looking into like VHF man packs, but then. You know, your distance becomes an issue, so then you look into repeaters, but then you can't link your repeaters because then you have to use some sort of, like, Wi-Fi signal. But if you don't want to use a Wi-Fi signal, then you need another transceiver, and then just the cost heads up fast. And That's why you got to get the lunchbox from Mojave. <laughs> well, see, and, and those are RA2, but then at the same time, you can only do analog with those. You can't do mm. digital, which means then you're not encrypted, which then means it's like... Those are those are useful. Um, I would like to get one of those and do some video content on it, um, just from like the analog perspective. Maybe the less opsec related comm oh, stuff. Sure, just but practical f- usage. But for me, it's like I, I take the opsec side of comms really, really seriously. Like I'm not. I don't want to. Like now that we have moved on to a higher um, form of comms, I don't want to compensate um, or give up security in a sense you want to compromise you guys yeah yeah no i get i totally get you man once you get to that echelon it's you you really can't go back Mm -hmm. and we're we're about to take that next leap too um because we're running fangs i mean for what we do right now they work obviously Mm -hmm. we're not going to stay with them for the long run but at the time for the time being uh cost wise uh, they're, they're good for uh, starting out. They're good for training on basic etiquette and things like that. Um, sure. But once you guys get the the money built up, or you got you're lucky and you got an OnlyFans, you, <laughs> something like that, you just drop a you know drop ten thousand dollars on like a solid ass team radio setup. You know, it really it really doesn't cost that much though. It really doesn't. Oh, if you no. if you have the know how, you can get into the port the the portable game like a Motorola or if you're on UHF the EF Johnsons are even cheaper but you can get into that game for like three to six hundred dollars depending on the condition of what you're getting and how much you're getting of what and whatnot like it's really not it's not horrible the market no, it's starting not, to get, the market's actually, starting to get dried up a little bit more <laughs> yeah but I mean I guess if you have twenty guys in the group yeah then you're looking close to ten thousand dollars yeah if you're trying to outfit everybody all at once and that's kind of that's kind of how we're trying to do it. We want to get everybody on the same page at the same time, so everybody gets trained at the same level, so we're not you know leaving anyone behind. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's expensive, man. It's and that's kind of why sure. we're it's kind of why we have the dues that we we you know we pay into the group. It really offsets a lot of the cost. Helps us that, get what we need. 
that was not a question, but I guess that's a good thing we could talk about is um, group dues. We have a group due too, um, basically a pot that goes into group projects, mm-hmm. like group medical equipment, group comms equipment, administrative stuff, group maps, stuff like that. Uh, I think every group should do it. And you don't got to do it a ton. Do 20 or 25 bucks a month. Yeah, it they, doesn't take much, but it adds up quick. Yeah. I mean, if you've got four dudes, yeah, 20 bucks a person is kind of like, oh, I got 80 bucks. Yeah. And it's going to take a while to do it. But if you've got 20 dudes or 30 dudes or even more, and they're all putting in $20, now it's like, okay, now we can accomplish a project a month. Yeah. And things kind of start to roll a little bit. But you got to be consistent with it. you got to have good rules in place on how you're going to spend the money or how the choices is spent on the money. You know, if, I, if, if I'm you, if, if I'm – Giving advice to other groups, I would say that you know you need to have a majority vote on group purchases and just exactly. make that your SOP. Yep. Don't 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 give one guy free reign and be like every time you have an admin meeting, you're like, oh, by the way, I spent all five hundred dollars in the group fund. Um, yeah, I bought that- <laughs> these really cool chem lights, and it's like, well, what the what the hell, dude? No, no, yeah, I, I completely. And that's actually what we do. We for any uh, purchases that are made uh, using the group funds, we do take a, a majority vote. Um, and every month, a financial report is put out to the group so we know what we have, what we spent. It's basically, just like a basic finance expense report. Same for us. We do yeah. – ha- our finance report is basically what the what the fund balance is at the time of the meeting, what the prior month purchases were, and what ideas we have coming up and yep. what their estimated cost is. And it's – you know, I, I, some people message the group page and uh, – uh, yeah, I run the group page in case y'all didn't know. Huh? Um, <laughs> so, so some people have messaged me saying, you know, like, I don't see the need for dues, but, you know, something or something along those lines. I'm like, OK, that's that's fine. You don't need to see how we see it. But it really helps the group. You know, individually, you can build yourself up, but we want to build up the team and mm-hmm. we contribute our time. We contribute our money to it and we're building up together. And it, it, you know, it takes a little bit of money, but it's, it's, we pay twenty a month. It's not bad. Yeah, twenty months easy because what comes out of an ATM? Twenties. All right, boom, twenty. Exactly. We and thought about twenty five, but it's like, well, now the guy's got to find a five. Now you got to just do twenty. Ten and it's, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to do all that. But twenty's uh, good. It, it not only for like acquiring equipment and you know any kind of group projects, but also like morale events. Mm-hmm. You know, in, if you want to like reserve a field or something, at least in in the area where I'm at. You have to pay a deposit. Yeah. For a field, of, like a field day, you have to pay like like a liability. Da, da, uh, the hell am I trying to say? Liability deposit, security deposit. There you go. Um, and it costs money. And I, you know, I don't want any one guy to shell out two hundred dollars on a single pot. Sure. So we have, if we have the option to pull from the group fund, it's it's twenty a month. You're not missing it, and it's there if we need it. So, like next year, we're planning a Hershey Park group trip. You know, or think- like. A, uh, some kind of, uh, if not Hershey Park, some kind of a, what do you call it? Amusement park. There you go. Mm-hmm. My mind's blanking out. <laughs> we did a, a holiday party this past year between Thanksgiving and Christmas for the group and their families, and we rented a hall. There you go. And we did, I think it was like we did like 20 bucks a family, and then whatever was left after that, we took from the group fund. Yeah. Um, which wasn't a ton after everybody had contributed, you know, the extra 20 bucks for the holiday party. Um but I mean, it's a, it's a solid thing, man. And I, I highly recommend every group at least implement some sort of that. It allows your group to stay independent. You don't mm-hmm. rely on anybody else. You're, you're completely internal and you know, it's, it's your own little biome. So it just allows you a lot more freedom to do what you need to do, go where you need to go, get what you need to get. That and another aspect to it is if the group owns the gear, that means regardless of, of a, whoever leaves the group at any point in time, the group still owns the gear. Yep. Like if, if one guy – if you guys never do a group fund and never buy group project stuff and, you know, we did this project. Let's say we did a comps project. And this one guy got the tough book and the programming cables and took care of all that kind of stuff for programming the radios or whatever. Yep. And now he leaves the group. Now you've just lost your ability to do any of your stuff with your radios and whatnot because he took everything with him because he personally bought it all. That's that's one thing that actually, funny enough, was just discussed today uh, when we were going to purchase radios. If we were going to buy them individually, well, if one guy leaves, um, you know, we just lost that asset. We just lost one radio. So what we're going to do is buy them in bulk, 
and we're going to assign him because we have a quartermaster. We're going to assign him to the quartermaster. He's going to hold them, and every outing, uh, we're going to um, sign them out to everybody. And then at the end of the training, we're going to sign them back into the quartermaster. Mm, so nice. it's, you know, we and we have a decent surplus of gear and equipment that we have for loaner stuff that we were had a generous donation from uh, the emergency expert Chris um, recently. Uh, but everything goes to the quartermaster, and if you need it, it's signed out. So that way, in case anybody splits, it's still in retention with the group. Yeah, we have a logistics officer who a oversees the group uh, the group fund but besides myself yeah and he also tracks all of the group specific gear and on the inventory sheet it says what person has what piece of gear and once a quarter or whenever that gear is used at a training event they turn in a sl3 sheet to make sure that everything is with the gear and it's works and all that kind of stuff oh man you guys got nomenclature sheets <laughs> oh yeah i do i do dude i i've come up with all types of, of fancy stuff on my computer and whatnot i've got inventory I, I sheets for all our stuff hard. and oh yeah I've, I've, I've definitely lost my mind a little bit in the past couple <laughs> years you start to get into that administrative thing like oh man i gotta label everything i do i'm looking at it right now i'm looking at like our mass casualty tubs and our administrative tubs sitting on this giant shelf in my office right now um that's another thing, guys. If you don't have tubs to respond to mass casualty incidents, you should do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, last question here, uh, and then you know we can wrap it up or talk about whatever. Is, sure. Uh, one guy asked for tips on developing SOPs early on. So basically, you know, what kind of advice do you have for guys that are trying to set the good footing right off the bat? Uh, so SOPs are, are always a fun topic to talk about. Um, you got guys from different backgrounds, different walks of life. Uh, if you're by yourself, that's a different thing. But if you're with a group, uh, bouncing, off, bouncing ideas off each other can always be a point of contention at some points. Um, I would say go online and look at various types of SOPs for certain units. Mm. And I'm not talking about special forces. I'm talking about like just general general company-style SOPs, you know. Mm -hmm. Um that's, that's, I think that's a good jumping off point for SOPs. Like, thankfully, we were fortunate enough to have uh, a lot of prior service guys uh, in our initial startup group. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just kind of drew from our previous knowledge of, like, best practices, things we thought were great to keep, things we thought we could leave out. For example, if it's cold, you can put your hands in your pockets and not get yelled at, you know. <laughs> we thought that was a good thing to leave in. Um you can wear your beanie at any time of day. Yeah, you can wear your fleece cap at any point you deem convenient. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, uh, if you can draw on previous experience, man, like, you know, like I said, I'm prior, I'm prior army, uh, our mm. second and, you know, prior, uh, army and prior coast guard, prior Marines. We got all, we got the works, man. <laughs> and we all drew from previous experience. Like, what works as far as like uniformity? Do we want a uniform? Like, yes, we do because it appears more professional and it's a cleaner look. We have a working uniform. Like in the field, we have a, a public uniform, um, you know, for when we're not working in the field. Um, it's, it's just an overall professional look. We have SOPs for dues. We have SOPs for uh, field equipment. We have our pioneer gear, which is your shovels, your picks, your saws, things like that. We have shelter SOPs. So, you need to have a certain type of bag rating. You can't buy a, uh, you know, a, a door of the Explorer sleeping bag from Walmart and expect mm -hmm. yourself to survive the night because it's 30 below. <clears throat> One of my guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we have a certain bag rating. You can't, you know, you can't go above um, things like that. Just look at look at best practices from previous units. I mean, we can even put out a copy of our SOPs. It's, it's nothing top secret. I mean, it's just basic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, as far as like attendance, any kind of quote unquote disciplinary action to be taken, like if there's any kind of like harassment going on, you know, and that I hate that goes without saying, but we harass each other on a daily basis. But, you know, <laughs> it's just it's part of the part of being in the group is just a fun, fun, loving brotherhood. Um, so, yeah, for for us, um, if I were to suggest it to anybody, um, mm -hmm. there's really two sides of SOPs you kind of got to take. 
Uh, we have alpha articles, which are administrative, and we have Bravo articles, which are operational SOPs. And you should clearly distinct the two. Um, you know, you don't want to put, you don't want to have just one giant 37 page, you know, Word document with just everything in there. Categorize your stuff and split it up so it's easy to identify. Um, but as far as your like tactical SOPs, don't try to write out an SOP for every single operational or tactical thing under the sun. If I were, if I was a, a group starting off, I would pick either Army Doctrine or Marine Corps Doctrine, and I would stick with one. For us, it was Marine Corps Doctrine because one, I'm a prior Marine. We had been training on Marine Corps uh, Doctrine basically from the inception. We have other Marines in the group, so it was easy just to say, all right, our baseline of operational. SOPs is aligned with Marine Corps doctrine um, within our capabilities. There may be a few specific things that you may want to write out for like operational SOPs um, that are specific to your group. Like for example, we have an, an operational SOP on how we would specifically set up a, um, you know, a mass casualty incident. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, our vehicle SOPs or something like that. Yeah, that's something we may come up with. But on the administrative side as well, what are the attendance requirements? What are, you know, all of those recruiting requirements? All of that can be a document. Another document can be the uniform SOPs, gear SOPs, operational vehicle SOPs, and what gear they should have and just so on and so forth. And you can have – Oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I don't want to step on you. You got good momentum going. <laughs> hey, no, you're, you're good. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, like, uh, that's kind of what we did. We, we divvied up the SOPs in our areas of specialty. So, like, uh, anything field-related went to our senior training officer mm-hmm. who is uh, a thousand years in the, in the infantry. We're the same age, but he has a thousand years in the infantry. I don't know how that works. Um, <laughs> but I, while I was in, I did more administrative stuff, more organizing, more like uh, – I did, like, brigade-level administration which so, comes in handy. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as like organizing, so that's where my background lies. I, I, I'm not a good public speaker. Like, I'm mm-hmm. barely able to hold this conversation down just because I feel, I feel so awkward. But You're doing great. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. But when it comes to uh, organizing, th- that's, where I, that's where I thrive. So all the administrative SOPs came through my desk. All the tactical SOPs and field SOPs went through our senior training officer because he's – that's his bread and butter. Yeah. Uh, the – uh, the uh, the gear SOPs basically went through our quartermaster and so on and so forth. Like everybody had a sp- – and the comms SOP went through our comms guy. Um, so, yeah, like you said, divvy them up, sp- specify uh, cleared lines through each one. Don't – just one big jumbled mess because hmm. that's a nightmare <laughs> organizationally speaking. And, you know, it's okay to update your SOPs as you grow or as you change and whatnot. You know, starting off, if you're like, hey, I got me and two friends – we're going to start this group and then we're going to recruit from there. Start off your SOPs super basic. You know, don't try and write SOPs for a battalion size element because that's just <laughs> not going to work. Write SOPs for like, you know, a squad to maybe a platoon size element so you have room to grow, even though it's going to take you a while to get to a platoon size element anyway. <laughs> um, but it comes in waves. You know, it, it comes in waves. For us, you know, it, it really come and it came in a few big waves towards the end of last year and it, it was really good for us. Yeah. Um, but, you know, know, know what you're trying to accomplish. What is your main goal right now? And what are the capabilities you're trying to establish off the bat? Then write SOPs to that. Exactly. Um, very, very well do, said. Yeah, so. No, that was good, man. That's, I couldn't agree. Couldn't have said it better myself, literally. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all I've got for questions. Did you have anything you wanted to add on? I suppose just one little uh, – selfish little personal shout out we just uh had our webmaster complete our website and it was uh just launched today as a matter of fact oh i'm gonna look it up right now while you talk <laughs> first pmr.com yep. first pmr.com yep site slash slash only fans um, site cannot be reached is it first as in like one st ah yes one st pmr uh, okay i put first like properly spelled ah Pro- oh, properly, you, oh, we're improper. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. Yeah, it's it's a link to our OnlyFans, basically. Oh no, dude, this is this is fantastic. <laughs> I love everything about this right now. I appreciate there's, that. Yeah. There's not a ton, but it's very clean. Yeah, we didn't we didn't put a whole lot on there. Uh, we're trying to just 
getting launched in preparation to drop the applications. Oh man, this is clean as shit. <laughs> I love everything about all oh, this gallery is awesome. I am oh, just out. a heads up on the mobile gallery. It looks like it's, it's so tiny. You can't see it. It won't enlarge on the mobile, but as everybody has pointed out <laughs> to me so far, I love this. I, uh, the nerd side of me from like being a business owner is nerdy out on this. I love a good website. <laughs> well, we had one of the best webmasters design it. So this is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's staring at me right now. <laughs> well, Badger, what, uh, where can guys find you at on the gram? What's your guys is where, where, how can guys get a hold of you? So, uh, the guys, if they have any questions at all, they can either email us at admin at one S T P M R.com. First P M R.com. Uh, they can email us through the website. They can send me a DM through the Instagram page at First PMR. If they want to reach my personal page and harass me, that's uh, Primal Badger. And uh, that's basically it, man. Awesome. Well, Badger, thanks for coming on, man. Um, I definitely look forward to the stuff we've got lined up this year. Yeah. I can't wait. I can't wait to see Kilgore's pretty face again. Oh man, he's so he's so stoked. <laughs> he's stoked. <laughs> well. Yeah. Thank you for having me on, man. I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. I'm glad we could uh, we could bring some uh, answers to everybody's questions. Yeah, me too. Well, guys, that's all we've got for episode 21, Developing the Citizen Regroups. As always, train hard, train often. Tell me turn it down and I'ma only turn up louder. Yeah. Call me what you wanna, but you can't call me no coward. Yeah. Straight the numbers, we the people, still the ones with power. Fighting fire with fire, time to take back what is ours. Tell me turn it down and I'ma